welcome. Happy Sunday. Um, let's all stand in your aid to rejoice. Dear Lord, we just come here, God, just to experience you, Lord. To take in your presence, Lord, just to be a part of this communion, God, this morning with our brothers and sisters here, Lord. Lord, we just pray that we would be refreshed this morning, God. And that you would stir within us, God. I pray, Lord, that your message would go out this morning, God, that it would touch our hearts, Lord, that it would pursue us, Lord. And I pray that you be lifted high this morning. In Jesus' name.
Kings and kings. 
kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. But who can stop the Lord? Oh, my King. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lion.
Hello, where's, the, where's the sound crew? <laughs> right there? There we go. Good morning. Good morning, everybody outside. I hope you're nice and uh, warm out there. I think it's a little chilly. But thank God that there's no wind, right? Oh, right. Yesterday was crazy. It, I call it crazy hair day yesterday. Because my hair was all over the place. Good thing for stiff gel. I'm giving away my secrets here. <laughs> uh, we're glad to have you here this morning. If you have a bulletin, please pull it out. If you don't, raise your hand and they will get you one so that you can follow along, see what's going on in the church. Some exciting things coming up this year. The Lord is good, isn't he? All the time. Amen. All right. Center column, you see all of our our needs there at the top, I wanted you to, to see them first of all because usually we start at the top when we start reading and then we get bored by the time we get to the bottom we just don't read any more. So I want you to pray for those needs here in the church, lift them up to the Lord and pray that God will send people to help us out or maybe the Lord has been nudging at your heart to get involved 
And we want you to get involved because the enemy is drawing the line and he's daring us to cross that line now. And Christians have to stand up and begin to fight the battle because the battle is beginning. And we are finding that there are casualties in the church. Christians are falling away. They're not willing to make a stand. They're not willing to fight in the battle. And when you're fighting in the battle, that means you're going to get hurt, right? Yes. That means you're going to get hurt. It's so awesome how the body will react to a battle, a fight, a fierce, the anger, the pressure, that it will actually begin to slow down the blood. It will actually thicken the blood in a man's body so that if he gets cut, he doesn't bleed out as quickly as if he wasn't in that state of battle. And they've proven that in battles so that you can continue to fight that battle. And so... We're in a battle, guys, and we're going to have to stand up and fight. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm, I was like getting in my message already. <laughs> so, so keep these things in prayer. Keep these things in prayer. There are the needs for this little church here. Uh, online giving, just a note for those of you that use our online giving. We have changed our whole format. We're going with another company that is a little cheaper but also has a lot of little perks on there. In the future here, you're going to see online texting. You'll be able to give just by sending a text. Uh, so it'll be a little more convenient for some of you that are techies. Um, we're like trying to learn it right now. Michael's helping me out with it. So we've set it up. You'll see a new format. Uh, you're going to have to go back. If you have a recurring uh, setup, that's going to be canceled. And you'll have to go back and set it up, which isn't too difficult. <clears throat> you won't find, it, it's a little different. You won't find everything right there on one page. So you'll have to give. And then as you're giving, it'll ask you, is this say continual uh, giving you put yes and then you put in your information there or one time you won't see fund accounts at this moment but we're trying to get them up there somehow it's a little scroll so you hit the button and it'll scroll down to where you want to give it to men's study women's study you know or general or others or missions we're going to have things like that in there so so bear with us as we're changing our format it's going to save us a little money in the long run which is always good you know um, and it's going to be a little bit more convenient for us. So thanks for, for your support. I uh, really appreciate uh, all of you that support and give to this church of your tithe. Uh, as you may know, or maybe you don't know, but again, the enemy has drawn the line. And support for churches have gone down across the board, across America. I sat in a meeting with about 15 pastors in Southern California here. And every single one of them said their support has gone down. From the big churches, whose support has gone down by millions or hundreds of thousands, but by the little churches who have gone down to 10%. And this church has gone down to a 40% down. 40%. So that means we're living on bare minimum. So we understand what it's like to have hard times. We understand what you're going through you know, in your life and trying to make ends meet as we're doing that here. So, so keep us in prayer. I definitely need that prayer. And, and where God guides, he will provide. Amen. And, and he does and he is. So, but just across the board. So all of you that, that support this church, believe me when I say this, I really appreciate it because it's keeping us going here in the ministry. So couples dinner, February 10th. Before I say that, guys, and maybe gals too, Super Bowl Sunday. That's the third, right? Yeah. Yes. February. Your house? My house again. Woohoo! Oh, still there. <laughs> still there. So last year's game was like, wow, uh -huh. exciting. Okay. I think uh, Jacob was more excited than anyone else. <laughs> he was like all over the place, jumping and falling on the ground. And so it was just a great game. So if you're a Super Bowl fan, football fan, fan, sports fan, come on out to my house. Uh, Virginia, I'm sure we'll, we'll let you know what to bring so we can eat and, and have a good time. And ladies too, you're more than welcome. 
The 10th, we're having a couple's dinner here at the church, which is a Sunday night. <clears throat> What does the word of God say? That's not the desire anymore. Uh, let me rephrase that. It is a desire, but that is not the main focus. What young people want to know now is how do I live it out? What's the reality of it in my life? And they want discipleship. I spoke to a young man yesterday at our 25th anniversary, and he's talking about young men who just want to know how to get discipled and, and how that even works in our lives one-on-one -on -one, small little men groups with disciples so you're probably going to see that here in the future with some young men and myself sitting down and just being disciple we are just starting with a church discipleship you're all welcome to join us it is in the evening and we just You can, we can talk about anything you want to talk about. The church, your, your family, raising, you know, whatever it is. And it will minister to everybody. So that will be February 21st. All right, if I can have the ushers come forward. And it looks like I pretty much explained the declining of giving there and their generosity. And again, I, I can't say it enough. Thank you for those of you who, who support us. Appreciate that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just... Come before you now, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Lord, ultimately, I know and, and we all know, Lord, that you are in control and that you are more than able to provide for us. I think of the children of Israel in the desert and they begin to cry to Moses, we're hungry, we need food. And as Moses prayed and sought you face to face, you rained manna from heaven manna what was it we have no idea in fact that's what they call that manna means what is it mm -hmm. and they ate it because it nourished them and strengthened them lord and you provided for them but you told them not to gather on the seventh day but to only gather from monday to saturday and i'm sorry sunday to friday and on the sabbath day do not gather any at all that was a day of focusing on god of giving him glory and praising him and offering up offerings for what God has provided for them for those six days. And Lord, we want to just give back to you today. We want to trust you with our finances. We want to trust you, Lord, to take care of us. And when we give our 10% to you or your 10%, Lord, what we're saying is, Lord, we're trusting you to give us 90%. And Lord, you, you even said very clearly in Malachi, test me and see it ain't so. And I know many people have tested you. And they have found that God is faithful to always provide. Always provide. So Lord, we receive these offerings. We ask you give us wisdom to use them wisely in these days, Lord. And also, Lord, that you bless us with your word. Minister to our hearts. Speak to us, Father. Bring healing. Bring forgiveness, Father. And draw the line, Lord. And raise up men and women, Lord, that are ready to battle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I remembered one more thing. Um, some of you may know or may not know, but Willie passed away uh, recently. And we were having a memorial service for him February 8th here at the church, which is a Friday at 1, 1 p.m. So if you'd like to join us, those of you that, that knew Willie... Uh, you're more than welcome to, to join us. Uh, you can see Diane if you need more information or myself, and I'll direct you to Diane. 
So that will be February 8th here at the church. So, All right, let's open up our Bibles. Let's start in Genesis chapter 1, looking at verse 27. The Lord, the Lord has laid on my heart this message this morning. So we are taking a step back from our normal study in Corinthians. And I just want to talk about a certain subject. The theme of the message this morning is, He knew you before. The He there is God. Yes. God knew you before you were even born. Let that sink in for a second. God knew you before you were born. That means before your parents knew you. Before your parents even knew each other. God knew you before you were born. He knew you would be born one day and on what day and at what time and at what hospital and to who he knew it completely mm. and there's a line as i said that has been drawn by the enemy and the battle will be getting worse by the way and i think that we see it as i said earlier not only are our ties going down across the board in america but attendance to church is going down and we don't even know it and those that aren't attending church don't even know it. Because hearts have been changed towards the church. The church is not respected like it once used to be. The church is not valued like it once used to be. There seems to be a different value in discipleship, in small groups, in finding out fellowship in other places besides the church. But I'm here to say that God hasn't changed. Hebrews 10, 20 Five is still the same. Do not forsake the assembling of one another as some have. And it's a sign of the end times, he said. It's a sign of the end. In February, March, I'm going to begin a series and, and again, step back from our study in Corinthians and, and do probably a four-week study on prophecy talk about the signs of the end i really feel it's important that we mm -hmm. that we talk about that these things are happening today and the enemy's drawing a line and the enemy just drew a, a, a big line big line for us to see and some of you probably haven't seen it yet <clears throat> but just this last tuesday let me read something from the news here you know who charlie daniels was well some of you might know who charlie daniels was he's a country singer yes he, he has a famous song about the devil, you know, mm -hmm. the, he plays a fiddle and so mm -hmm. forth. But this is what he said. He said, um, and, well, let me see, that's not it. I'll just read what I've got here. Music icon Charlie Daniel blasted New York Governor Andrew Cuomo in a Saturday tweet asserting that a new state law that legalized abortion up until birth threatens to make the empire state resemble an infamous Nazi concentration camp. Wow. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but Tuesday, Como, governor of New York, signed into law as soon as he took his job from the Republicans that you could have an abortion all the way up to birth. You can murder your child. And there's no repercussion for it. It resembles... A Nazi concentration camp. Those are some harsh words. And what a picture. If I had the opportunity, and maybe one of these days I'll do that, there is a ticker, timer, a counter website that, that you can look up. And it ticks every time there's an abortion, every time someone has murdered one of their babies. And it is over 60 million babies who have been murdered. And it tells you every day, Every day, how many have been murdered every day? And every day it's in the thousands mm. that are murdered. The devil is drawing the line and saying, I dare you to fight against me. I dare you. He is having his way right now. He has found a way to get into the most safest place that a child could be, which is in the mother's womb, and destroy it. Literally kill it. Premeditated murder. And this morning, I would like to share a story with you. 
about two scared 15-year-old children who are on their way to Planned Parenthood to murder their baby. Premeditated murder. Two young kids. Can you imagine two young kids planting, planning together, conversing to murder their child? I can't imagine that. See, God values life, all life. And we read it from the scriptures, Genesis all the way to Revelation. God continues to open his arms out for humanity to come to him and surrender to his grace and to his mercies and blessings and generosity and prosperity. But we refuse because we think other things are so more are so more important than those things. God values human life from children in the womb to the elderly. That means that every single one of you are valuable to him. He created you in his image and he created you for a purpose and he created you to love you from beginning to end. That's how much he loves you. He says that you are the apple of his eye. That's how much he loves you. So much he cares about you. So much he loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So we should never doubt the love of God. Ever. And if you ever doubt the love of God, what you need to do is just look to the cross and be reminded how much he loved you. Amen. That he would give his son so that you could have eternal life. There in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God makes it very clear how much he loved humanity. It says in verse 27, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. Now the world will tell you that we evolved into who we are today. They've been doing this for tens of years. Now to our children... And our children who don't know Christ, who are unbelievers, are graduating high school believing that we just evolved to this state. They have no morals and no values. And so their life is moral. the warriors in he is separating the goats from the sheep Amen. Jesus gave us that analogy for those of you that don't know what I'm just said but goats are non-believers they pretend to be Christians uh, they think they're Christians and they'll even go to church claiming to be Christians but they're not really involved in the battle like the sheep they're not involved in what God has planned for them they're just living life out without really serving him, without living for him, without surrendering to him. And God now seems to be dividing them and causing the goats to leave and the sheep to stay that are wanting to be in the battle, that want to do something for God, that want to change this world. And the enemy is drawing that line. God says, no, I created mankind, man and woman. And scientifically, we can prove that, and they've proven it. But they just lie to our children and say, no, we all evolve. Well, that's a theory, right? That has been a theory. It's still a theory. There's no evidence. So, well, we're just waiting for that missing link. Well, they'll be waiting forever while they're killing our children with this lie. No, the Bible says God created man and woman in his image. And science has proven it. Biology has proven it. You can look at the DNA of a human being and you can see there's just an organized plan, schematic, the function of it all. The patella, which is a cell that helps 
repair your body is literally a motor. And you look at it under the microscope and it is a motor that's running and spinning and doing repairs and going around. Now for us to create a motor, we'd have to put parts together to create it to do and function in a certain way. Just like we do outside the world. Our car is a motor and it takes us places. That little patella is a motor and it does and it functions as though someone created it. And it's very clear when you look at it. No, God created us. Look at Psalms 139. Turn there in your Bibles. I'm going to have you turn a few places. Just so you see this, you need to see what God says about life. Because he knew you before you were even born. In Psalms 139, verse 13, it says, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Now, I think a mother relates to this more than, than and, and a father does too, than anything else. Because when they see that child come from the womb, it is the most beautiful thing that they have ever seen. It is the most beautiful time of their life. I, can, I have four boys, and I saw every single one of them come into this world. And I'll tell you, every one of them was just as great as the first one. It's a beautiful thing. And you can see this little child that's all red and prickly and hair is all over the place and it comes in and you go, that was fearfully and wonderfully made. And so have you been made fearfully and wonderfully. God made you in his image because he loves you. And the psalmist rejoices in that fact. It gives him hope and it gives him purpose. Jeremiah chapter 1, if you want to turn there. <clears throat> Jeremiah said, before I formed you, he writes the words of God, and he says, God said this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah must have been encouraged by that. Because Jeremiah lived during a time like ours where he preached his heart out and everybody said, hey, praise God, hallelujah, that was a wonderful message. But the Bible says they walked away and they did nothing with it. It just went in one ear, as my dad used to say, and it went out the other. He would direct us and tell us, you need to go do this, son, and then it'd go in one ear and go out the other and we wouldn't do it. Jeremiah did so many strange things. God, he gets it right now. My mother-in-law, just before Willie, went home to be with the Lord. She gets it now. They now understand what eternity is. And I'll guarantee you, just like Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man probably, and anyone that's in heaven now says, I wish I could go back and tell a lot more people of what I see now. Because now I know what it's about. And I wasted a lot of time playing video games. <laughs> I wasted a lot of time watching the tube. I wasted a lot of time doing things that I probably shouldn't be doing. God's drawing the line, guys. Listen to Job. Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? God created everyone. He created them and he created us in our womb. 
Psalms 22 says, From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. And Isaiah 49 says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Then he says this, Though she may forget, I will not There are mothers and fathers who plan to murder their baby before they're even born. They sit down and they weigh out the consequences. Can we afford this? Can, can we really take the responsibility? What would people say if we had a child? And they weigh this all out and they plan and they write the pros and the cons down. And then they plan... Plant, planned parenthood, write it down there. Without the word murder, without the word killer, and they plan, this is an option here. That is premeditated murder, guys. That would be like you, and, and I just read a story. And they plan to murder their child before they're born. Can a mother forget? Yes. If there are 60 million babies that have been murdered, then there have been 120 parents who have forgotten their child. But he says in the end there in Isaiah 49, 15, I will not forget you. That's a promise from God. See, God's saying is that if your parents, who's supposed to love you, forget you, I will not forget you. I love you more than your parents love you. I love you more than you can even imagine because I, you think your parents created you? No, I created you before the foundations of the world. I thought about you, had a plan and separated you, and I have a purpose for your life, and so I have invested everything into you, and I will never forget you isn't that great hope doesn't that bring peace that god does not forget us now I, I i get it i know sometimes we're going through hard things emotional things and we think well where's god where is he in this battle that i'm in right now he's with you he's with you and he's going to give you strength and he'll help you through it you just have to be faithful to him no matter what you hang on to him you don't let go uh, David, if you look at David's story, he seemed to have a, have a life of constant running, constant battles, constant fighting with his children even, and his wives even. And all because he sinned with Bathsheba, a repercussion of his sin. It's his own fault. And yet he had a heart after God. Now how do you, how do you work that out? You know? How can you do something like that and yet still have a heart after God? Well, you know because you do it all the time. We all do it all the time, right? We do things that are evil and wrong, and then also we're like, how could I do that? And, and then you're like, but I love you, God, and, and help me and forgive me, but then you go and do it again. We do it all the time. Paul did it. I'm not condemning you because I'm, I'm sitting right there with you. Paul even did it, right, in, in Romans uh, chapter 7. Why is it that the things that I know I should be doing, they're good things, they're godly things, they're things that are edifying for the body of Christ, for myself, they'll be positive, they'll bring growth, they'll bring prosperity. I don't do them. I don't do them. In other words, I understand 
that they're good for me, that they'll help me. But then right here, that emotional heart says, but that's not really what I want to do. I don't want to do that. I find myself not doing them. Then he says, but the things that I know I shouldn't be doing, that means in their head they know, this is no, this is off limits. You don't, you don't do this. You don't go on that path. You don't cross that line. Because it's going to hurt you, not just you only, but it's going to hurt maybe your family and other people. It's going to bring uh, shame to the Lord's name and so forth. You know, and you get that all intellectually in your mind. So forth. But then your heart says, but I want to do them. But my heart wants to do them. It's like being hungry and I got to eat. My stomach hurts and I have to eat something. And it, otherwise I can't, oh, I can't think. I can't move if I don't eat something. And that's how it feels. And Paul's like going through this battle. It's like two natures, the spiritual and the flesh, and they're fighting each other. You know what I'm talking about. We do that all the time in our head. We, we, we speak to ourselves more than we speak to other people. And then he said in chapter 8, thank God. Thank be to God that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, never forget you i will always be there with you it might feel like it you might feel you're alone but you're not alone and god is there with you and we're here for you to encourage you to strengthen you to point you back to jesus christ to help you along the way uh, to to equip you even if that's what it takes to get you to that point where you're trusting in christ jesus again See, my testimony is that I and my wife were those 15-year-olds who were plotting to murder, premeditated murder, my eldest son. Now, many of you don't know Modesto, but some of you do. And he turned out to be a pretty good guy. Amen. I just recently, uh, <clears throat> one of the guys that works with him was here working on the kitchen and and he turned to me and he said, you're Modesto's father. And I said, yeah. He goes, you did a good job. Of course, you know me. I'm like, nah, it wasn't me. It's the Lord and, and my wife. I'm just a wretched sinner. He goes, no, you, you did a good job because I don't know of anyone as honest as he is. I mean, the guy is fair. He doesn't gouge people. You know, just above board. And in fact, he was so moved that, that he, he said, would you mind if you could counsel one of my children? And I says, no, of course, I would, I would love to do that. So that's how impressed he was with my son. This is, <clears throat> you know, when I say that I'm a chief of sinners, I, I mean it because there I was at 15 years old, my wife and I were having relationships as kids, and she gets pregnant. And then we start planning, what are we going to do? Because we're 15, how are we going to raise this child? Where's the fun going to come when we have to stay at home with this baby and give it milk and change its diapers and buy clothes? What about our lives? What about our fun? What about our sexual relationship? Is that going to stop too? We were totally selfish and self-centered and we began to plot and we began to bring others involved in this plot like you normally do, accomplices. And we got their opinion. Yeah, there's a Planned Parenthood and they can take care of that stuff. And we contemplated that and looked at that and said, that's the route we want to take. Let's go to Planned Parenthood. This little wholesome family medical center that really cares about you they'll help us out it's a slaughterhouse for babies 
That's the gas chamber that Charlie Daniels was talking about. And we decided at that age, we didn't drive. <laughs> She's pregnant, but we don't have a license to drive. And so the friend that was our accomplice said, hey, I'll drive you down there. So we got in our vehicle from Roland Heights, and we began to drive towards Pomona. <coughs> got off at Gary Avenue. <coughs> and there's a Planned Parenthood on the left side. And we got there, drove into the parking lot, and parked. And all four of us sat there, looked at each other for a minute or two. And then Virginia and I looked at each other. I thought, okay, let's do this. We got out of the car, went in to go into the building, and as we tried to get in the building, it was closed. It had just closed, so we weren't able to go in. We got back into the car, and we sat there, thought, we can't go in. We're going to have to come back another day. It's like the plot and the plan, planning was all disturbed by something, but that's okay. We're going to go through this anyway. We'll come back another day, just like criminals do. Didn't work out the first time. Let's just figure out something else. But as we were going home and, and thinking about it, and I don't remember if I, I was sharing with Virginia or we were talking about it, but in my head, at least I was religious. We grew up in the Catholic home, and of course Catholicism is totally against abortion. In fact, they are going to excommunicate the governor of New York, who is Catholic. They're going to excommunicate him from the church for what he has done. <clears throat> at least they'll do that. But being that religious person, I felt maybe God is showing us a sign here. I didn't believe in God. I didn't live for God, but I just thought maybe God's showing us a sign here. Maybe he doesn't want us to go through this situation. <clears throat> and so we looked at each other and we thought, let's, let's look at another option. And we found out that she could still go to school. They had special classes for pregnant teens. Obviously, I go to school and I'd start working. And so I started working three jobs. She began to receive <clears throat> funds from the state to help her with this pregnancy. And on Memorial Day of 1978, the 29th, we were on our way to the beach because we love the beach. We're youth. We want to have fun. <laughs> pregnancy, we don't care about that. You know, let's just go. And she says, no, I've got to go to the hospital. And we were able to have him in what they called at Whittier, Whittier Hospital there in Whittier, um, an ABC room. And it's just basically a bedroom without all the equipment of an operating room. And it had a bed. It had a, a sliding door and wallpaper. It looked just like a bedroom. And we had that baby there. Now let me digress a little bit because we prepared for that baby. We went to the Lamaze classes, you know, to prepare how to breathe, you know. <laughs> I had to breathe with her otherwise I'd faint and so we're in these classes mind me 15 years old by the time she has it in May was 16 we're in these classes with 25 year olds and 30 year olds taking these classes and they're looking at us like what are you guys doing here <laughs> we're having a baby what you're 15, 16 years, you're not happy. Yeah, we're having a baby. You know. How embarrassing that is. But we went through it. And boy, I tell you, when he was born, it was the most exciting thing to see him come into this, this world. And I thank God, I thank God that, that he closed those doors. Because his parents forgot about him for that moment, right? Yeah. And God did not forget about him. God did not forget about him. And he closed those doors and he began to change our minds. And today, I have a beautiful, handsome son. And I got three beautiful grandchildren from him. My oldest granddaughter, Gabby, is engaged to a <laughs> handsome Christian artist, mm -hmm. and she loves the Lord. Amen. My other two are one of them. My son, grandson, Ethan, is graduating next year. Angelina is smart, mm -hmm. and I tell you, if 
I had done what I, my flesh wanted to do, they would not be here. They would not be here. And so let me say this in ending. If you are contemplating that, it's not worth it. See, God will find a way Amen. to get you through those things. He'll find a way. We, she got funding from the state. Thank God for that. And I appreciate that. But I didn't neglect my responsibility. I worked three jobs. I worked for a pottery company. What does a fifth, 16 year old do? You know, labor, labor works. I made pots. You know, and then we thought, well, we're making them. Let's buy them and let's sell them too. So we worked <laughs> on Saturdays and Sundays at swap meet selling pots. And then I worked for a screening place. So, you know, when you screen on your windows, you need to replace them. Call me and work for a place, and I'd make them and then come and install them for you. And then I started working for her father-in-law, or for my father-in-law, just doing electrical work. And that's where it pushed me towards Southern California Edison. And just one thing, naturally, God just kept going and going. And then finally I got a job with Edison. And the reason that I got a job with Edison was because of affirmative action. Some of you might know what that is. Because I was, I'm not, smart, I'm not a smart guy. Uh, I took a few classes in electronics and, you know, worked with my father-in-law putting stuff, not understanding it all, but I thought it was enough, but it wasn't. But I remember the guy interviewing me and, and he interviewed me and asked me a lot of questions. I'm, I'm mechanically inclined. I can figure that out. And that's something my dad gave me or my mom. I think it was my mom because my grandfather was mechanically inclined. That means that you just figure out things real easy. <clears throat> but then he asked me, how many kids do you have? And I said, I got four boys. Really? What's their ages? And he kept asking about my family more than anything else. And I really believe it was because of that that he hired me. This man needs a job. This man needs to take care of his family. This man's responsible. And then God just, you know, helped me along the way. I remember going into the test for Testman Helper. And I was in this interview. And they said, how would you convert AC electricity into DC. Now that's like the power lines coming in. That's AC. It's, it's a wave of, of electricity coming in. DC is just a straight line. How do you do that? And I'm like, I, in my head, I'm thinking, I have no idea how you do that. <laughs> like, what am I going to answer here? And one of them looks at me and says, think about an alternator in your vehicle. I'm like, yeah, an alternator in the vehicle. That's how you do it. I just said what he said. <laughs> But he wanted more. Well, how does that work? And I'm like, well, it converts AC into DC. <laughs> you know, that AC goes in there in a sine wave, you know, and then it comes out and he's like, good enough. <laughs> you know? And they, they hired me. Why did they hire me? Because when I was part-time working there, I met a Christian man who was a manager of the Central Communications Center, which runs all the grids in Southern California. He gave me my first Bible. He told me the story of King David. He shared the gospel with me. He went over there and talked to them. And then he came back and says, you're hired. See, God finds a way. Amen. Though my parents forget me, I will not forget you. I will not forget you. God is faithful to never forget you. If you're planning on having abortion, don't do it. See, God will figure it out. He'll lead you along the way. He'll take care of it. He'll provide for you. He promises that to his children. If you have had an abortion, I want to encourage you also because God has not forgotten you. Nor does he condemn you. There's forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says very clearly, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. You know, we have made some bad decisions in life for whatever reasons.
David stood up, brushed himself off, began to eat, and he walked off and began to do business. And the world looked at him and said, what are you doing? That makes no sense because usually when our childs die like that, we mourn for a long time afterwards. We, we, we go beyond. We, we meditate. We, it, it consumes us. We become helpless. We, we, we can't go on in life, you know, as though they have no hope. And David says, oh, no, no, no. You know, when I die, I'm going to go home and see him. I'm going to heaven with them. That's the hope we have in Jesus. That's the hope that David had. And so when children die in this world, under the age of accountability, not knowing the Lord, they go to heaven to be with God. And so our children who have passed are in the presence of God already. Amen. God forgives you. Your children are there. The thing is now forgive. we surrender our lives completely to him the enemy's drawn the line guys he has drawn the line we've had 25 years of serving him in this community now we have another 25 from this point forward and i'm calling the church out rise up get involved get serious with the lord we don't have a whole lot of time left they just legalize murder they just legalize it. That baby can be born and you can kill it. That's bad. What's next? They legalize homosexuality. You can marry now, same sex. What's next? What's next? The gay, the lesbian, transsexual, the pedophilers are now rebranding their names to be more presentable to society because they have rights too. It's not a sickness, it's a choice, and they can have sex with children if they want to. Is that next? It's on the list, and it's happening. We're going to live in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah if we're not already there. We need to wake up. We need to see what's going on. And the time is short. The Lord is coming quickly. Amen? Amen. He's coming quickly. Maybe not in our lifetime, who knows, but he's coming. And things are looking like he's coming. And we need to get busy with the gospel. If you would like forgiveness, I'm not going to ask you to stand. <clears throat> I wouldn't do that. It, maybe you have had an abortion. I know a lot of people who have had abortions. And I want you to know that you can be forgiven. Let's bow our heads and let's just pray silently if you've never asked the Lord to forgive you. And I want you to know that you're forgiven as you do so. Father, not only have I Christianity you forgave David of murder and committing adultery, Lord. And so you can forgive me. You can wash me, cleanse me, Lord. And I can be set free from that bondage. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood that you shed on that cross for me, Lord. And now I'm set free. It no longer holds me. And the guilt, there is no guilt. It's a lie from the enemy because God does not condemn us. And now I'm set free to serve you, Lord. Help me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Put me on the right path to serve you, Lord, in my life, wherever that may be, Lord. I need you in my life. I call out to you and say, come into my life and be my God and be my Savior. I surrender myself to you completely. As the enemy has drawn the line, so I'm going to step over that and confront the enemy in my life and begin the battle. 
With your help, Lord, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. And if God is for us, who can stand against us? For our God is the God of gods, little g. He is the Lord of little lords. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And one day he will sit upon that throne and we will cast our crowns to him in worship and adoration. And we will be victorious along with him because of the work that God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. Because we are the children of God. And we have authority in the name of Jesus. And we will go forward. And we will fight in these battles of ours, Lord. And we will be victorious, Lord. And we will join this church and become warriors, become servants, become brothers, become a part of the family here, Lord. And I pray that in Jesus' name.